Well, if you're listening to this in the audio format, it's probably best watched on video. We're gonna be going through some of my tournament masterclass. It actually launched last night. We're still putting some finishing touches on it, but all the course content is available for you in Poker Coaching Premium. Hope you're all having a fantastic day. We have a Black Friday sale going on right now. Check it out at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. We have big, big discounts. And if you sign up to Poker Coaching Premium, you can start going through the tournament class right now. It's over 30 hours long, 180 parts. If you count the additional um, content where I'm like playing hands and playing full sessions, then it comes out to more like 45 hours. So lots and lots of content there for you. And it'll teach you how to play tournaments. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through some of these slides. Again, if you're listening to this, I appreciate you listening to this, but it's probably best off watched today because we're going to go through some of the PowerPoints. So first things first, this masterclass applies to all tournaments. So many people get it in their minds that... I play this particular game, therefore I need something tailored to this very, 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 very specific game. And, you know, in the ideal world, if you could have some sort of um, poker genius come down and make you a an exhaustive, extensive course on your very specific game, it would probably be better than a slightly more general product. However, it's not how the real world works. This took me about a year to get finished. And um, people aren't going to devote a year to making a course on exactly $54 semi-turbo sit-and-goes with a 6% rake. You know what I mean? So we're going to do our best. Understand that at the end of the day, poker is poker in general. As the stakes increase, skill levels tend to increase. And typically players play online at the same buy-in level. Substantially better than live players of that buy-in level. I mentioned... Make sure you know the fundamentals. Again, we're not going through the whole course right now. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a teaser. If you lack the fundamentals, that's not good, right? So I kind of expect you to already know everything in the Master of the Fundamentals course. It's completely for free. What's the URL? Trypokercoaching.com slash fundamentals, something like that. So um, check that Check that out. What do you think is the best tournament? The one that you win not the one with random blind levels. The one that you win is the best tournament. Um, again, like things like blind levels, people try to obsess over these things, and at the end of the day, they just don't matter all that much. They matter a little bit, but spending substantial time thinking about these things, I think, is kind of a waste of your time. You should be spending your time getting good at poker, because at the end of the day, if you look what I do whenever I play on Sundays, I play just literally every tournament that runs. It's like $100 to $5,000. And... I don't care about the structure because it doesn't matter at the end of the day. You have some edge. Your edge is lower in turbo tournaments, but that's fine. They take less time, right? It's a trade. All right. We go through tournament structure. We discuss standard variance, right? Understand that you're going to have variance in poker tournaments, of course. We, we make that very, very clear. We go through equity. Let's see if I can find some good stuff. Good, useful, exciting stuff. We discuss common pot odds, right? how um, you need to make sure you memorize these very common situations. And then once you know, if you're getting four to one, three to one, two to one, 1 1.5 to one or one to one, if you're somewhere between these numbers, you know you're somewhere between, you know, let's say you're getting 1.3 to one, you know you're somewhere between 40 and 50%, right? So you can estimate to some extent. We discuss ranges, how to think in terms of hand ranges, right? Hand ranges are very, very important. We discuss range versus range, right? It's important to know how your hand fares against your opponents, but also how your entire range fares against your opponent, right? That's very, very important. We discuss combining equity, pot odds, and range. We discuss counting combinations. Here's how it works. For example, on a6-4, how many combinations of a6 of a for two pair exist, right? Well, you know there's normally 16 combinations of a6, but if we remove the ace of hearts and the six of clubs, we end up with these, nine, right? And we go through, it's just simple multiplication, 
How many of each unseen card remains? Three aces are left, three sixes are left, three times three equals nine, right? But if your opponent only plays the suited ones, then only two exist on this particular board. If it was ace of hearts, six of hearts, four of diamonds, and three ace six, suited would exist. So you go through counting combinations. We discuss implementable strategies and how we went about designing them. This course does discuss using um, GTO, Pio Solver ranges, or Munker Solver ranges where it made sense, and also an implementable strategy. We show how we went through and made these implementable charts that we have that are downloadable for you at pokercoaching.com in the tool section. Check that out. And um, here's the GTO chart. As you see, they are quite similar. Not perfectly exactly similar, but quite similar. Am I in quarantine? Yeah, I have to go get tested today. Um, I just came back from Vegas, so I've been sitting in the bedroom for the last five days. And then we go get tested today. You're up a thousand euros since joining Poker Coaching Premium less than a month ago. Nice. Good job. Good work. We also discuss post flop strategies, as you can see. Again, making them implementable, showing the differences, the similarities, right? Notice here we have lots of hands in, that are mixed in the solver. But for simplicity, you can just sort of combine lots of these. It's not perfect. It's not perfect, but it's close enough. We discuss how chips change value. We discuss risk premium. All right, playing before the flop. Stack depth matters. We go through recommended pre-flop raise sizes. Right? Recommended pre-flop raise sizes are very, very important. It's nice to make sure you stick with them to some extent unless you are trying to exploit your opponent. Went through quizzes during the free premium days and you got third in the Sunday warm-up for a thousand bucks. Good job, good work. We discuss pre-flop range composition. We have linear ranges, polarized ranges, right? Discuss condensed ranges, which are just the hands in green here, right? Let's see what else we have. We go through lots and lots of pre-flop strategies. Of course, many of these are already available at pokercoaching.com. Counting combinations looks really interesting, even for those not playing tournaments. Oh, we already have a cash game course, Mark. We already have a cash game masterclass. I'm actually going to go back and expound on it based on what I've learned in the process of making this course. But that kind of thing's already discussed in the cash game course. I mean, either play cash games or tournaments, right? So um, we already have a cash game masterclass. But the tournament one took a little bit longer because we had to discuss all sorts of stack depths, right? So we could discuss when you raise and get three bet. We discussed developing implementable strategies for that. Let's see, let's see. All this is pre-flop stuff. Facing limpers, how to adjust your strategy. Facing a raise and a call. We discuss playing against various player types, right? Right, facing a pre-flop raise and a call. If your opponent's a nit, you want to be bluffing less often. You want to be calling with more implied odds hands, right? If your opponent's tight aggressive, just follow the 75 big blind charts. If your opponent's loose and aggressive, you want to be bluffing more. If your opponent's a calling station, you want to be value betting more, right? Lots and lots of graphics like this that'll help you understand how to adjust your opponents. Let's see. We discuss effective stack size, stack to pot ratio, how, you know, when you're deeper stacked, you're, you're going to play a different strategy than if you're shallower stacked. We discuss adjusting when your raise gets three bet, right? Say you raise from the low jack seat to 2.5 big blinds with ace jack and the button three bets to 7.5 big blinds out of his 45 big blind stack. Okay, what do we do? We should be adjusting, right? Against a tight player, we should just fold. Against a calling station, we should probably go all in. And against an overly loose aggressive player, we should probably shove, right? So you see, our strategy changes substantially based on what your opponent is doing. So you always need to make sure you adjust. Let's see, cutoff versus button and cutoff versus big blind. We compare various ranges, right? As you can see, cutoff, you're going to use a different strategy then in the big blind, right? Whenever you get three bet. So anyway, we go through all sorts of different scenarios like this. Let's see, facing four bets. As we get shallower stacked, we discuss all sorts of stack depth issues. Let's see, let's see, let's see. Got to make sure we don't run over our time here today. Look at these nasty ranges. Yuck. <laughs> All right, let's move over to post-flop. Post-flop. 
Betting versus checking. Very, very important, right? It's very, very important. Came in 34th out of 9,000 the other day. Good job, good work. All right, so we, whenever we discuss that you can have four possible decision pairs on the flop, you how you can bet and then not fold if you get raised, right? You can bet and then perhaps fold or perhaps continue. Usually when you have a draw, you can check and then call, and you can have junk, right? So you want to make sure you're categorizing the four types of hands. For example, on nine, on queen nine seven, a hand like ace queen is a premium made hand that's just happy to get a lot of money in. A hand like king eight suited or jack ten or ten eight is a draw, right? King nine of clubs is a middle pair type hand. And um, jack six offsuit or jack six of clubs is just total garbage. Oh wow, Andrea points out we have two webinars today. One from Giraffe Ganger and one from Matt Affleck. Very nice. Ooh, Giraffe Ganger must be a live stream from 3 to 11 p.m. Well, that's exciting. I love watching his streams. I always learn something. We discuss how um, on the flop, we have the hand types flow chart. Typically, you should be betting in essentially most scenarios with 33% premium hands, 67% draws. And often, not always, but often checking with marginal made hands, 70% 70, 70 marginal, 30% junk. We're going to go through and explain how to do that. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Continuation betting. That is a post-flop bet made by the pre-flop raiser. And there are two main factors here, frequency and size. And frequency is determined primarily by the hand types, the four hand types, range advantage and position, whereas your betting size is primarily determined by who has the nut advantage, your opponent's range connectivity, and stack depth, okay? Do you all know this? These are the main factors that, that Im impact these decisions. So we already discussed the four hand types. Range advantage, what is range advantage? It's the idea that on a particular board, one player will have more equity than the other. For example, on a 7 6 if we take an under-the-gun preflop range on the top against a big blind preflop range on the bottom, you see on a 7 6 the preflop raiser has 65% equity, which is humongous. This is a big range advantage, right? On 7 6 5 we just change that ace to a 5, you see now it's close to 50-50, right? Now there's not such a big advantage. And you're going to find that typically when you have a strong advantage, you bet basically everything. When you have a moderate advantage, you do a decent amount of checking, usually with extra bluffs. And with a weak advantage or no advantage, you do a whole lot of checking. And you're usually betting very polarized with just your premium hands and draws. Is the tournament class out? Yes, it is. It was released last night. Frequency is also determined by position. Typically, you're betting more often in position than out of position. So that is important to note. Um, we also discuss common board types when in position. We discuss your equity. Your equity is also impacted by the fact that um, your opponent's range is going to be stronger when they're in particular positions, right? Like a small blind calling range is stronger than a big blind calling range, and a button calling range is stronger than a big blind calling range, right? So you're going to see when you're in position, you typically have this much equity on all of these boards, which is important to note. You don't have to memorize these exactly, but you need to understand the um, differences between these boards, right? Like the low card boards are not all that great for you, whereas the higher card boards are quite good for you, right? And we again make it clear, strong range advantage, bet frequently, right? So whenever you see all greens up here, you're betting very frequently. Moderate range advantage, you're betting, you know, kind of frequently. See the blues here, some of the blues, and then low advantage, we're not. How do we get our percentages? Game theory, that's just on the flop, by the way. We're talking about the flop right now. Turn and river come later. The one, one premium hand to two draws is what you should roughly have on the flop if you are betting very polarized. Um, what's next? Let's see. What's this? Okay. Now, out of position. Take a look at this. All blue. All blue and red. When you're out of position, if you're trying to play fundamentally sound, you must do a lot of checking from out of position, often looking to check raise, which we discussed thoroughly. Um, by the way, so far, everything we're mainly discussing is discussing how to play against people who play well. We discuss how to adjust to take advantage of whatever they do wrong throughout the course as well. So from out of position, you have to check sometimes. You never have a strong range advantage out of position. Actually, there are a few corner cases, but very rarely will that be the case. So that lets you know how frequently you should be betting. 
Next, bet. I'm sorry. That's how. Um, that's how frequently you should be betting. Now let's discuss the bet sizing. Essentially, sizing and frequency kind of go together. Not always, but kind of. Um, as you bet more frequently, you generally bet smaller, typically, because you're betting with a more um, linear range, essentially. And as you're I'm sorry, as you're betting less frequently, you bet big because you're polarized. As you bet more frequently, you bet generally bet smaller. Is this for online or live or both? Both. We discussed that right at the top of the at the top of the, the video today. Is this all from me? Yes, all new content from me. None from anyone else. Also, nut advantage, very, very important. Sizing is determined by nut advantage. Do you get set up on ignition? Yes, but I was very disappointed with their game selection there. Um, let's see. So, nut advantage example. Under the gun raises, big blind calls, flop comes ace, jack, ace, king, jack. Who has more premium hands? This is what you want to ask to determine who has the nut advantage, right? On ace, king, jack, think about it. Look at these ranges in play, under the gun versus big blind. You see under the gun has all sorts of nut hands, right? Aces, kings, jacks, ace, jack, ace, king, ace, queen, ace, ten, right? So you see, under the gun has like all of this good stuff, whereas the big blind has a few good hands. They have queen 10, right? They have ace jack, they have king jack, but they also have a whole lot of nonsense, right? And this is gonna give them a very big advantage. However, on jack 5-5, five, five, notice that the big blind has all the fives, or at least a lot of the fives, and under the gun has none. So in both scenarios, under the gun is going to have the range advantage, but, but the big blind is going to have the nut advantage on the jack-5-5 five five board. And it turns out you're often supposed to bet pretty big on the ace-king-jack board because you have a big range advantage and range connectivity, which we'll discuss in a second. Whereas on jack-5-5, five five, uh, the big blind has a big nut advantage, and that actually forces you to check more often. And when you do bet, you often bet very, very tiny if you're going to be betting as the preflop progressor. So cool stuff there. We discussed range connectivity. Um, this is essentially the idea that as your opponent's continuing hands are like obviously decent, like on ace king jack, if they're going to call you, it's going to be with like a jack or better, which is pretty good. Typically, you want to be betting bigger in that scenario. Whereas when their continuing range is like junkier, like on jack five five, they should be continuing with you know queen nine backdoor flush draw. Typically, people don't call big bets with queen high. Therefore, you typically want to be betting smaller in those scenarios. And then stack depth, right? As we're shallower, we bet shorter. As we are deeper, we bet bigger. And putting all that together, we come up with this range advantage flow chart, which will let you know how much to bet in basically every scenario and how often to bet in basically every scenario. How useful. <laughs> okay, so let's just go through this real quick. Frequency, are we in position or out of position? Let's say we're in position. Okay, do we have a strong range advantage, moderate range advantage, or weak range advantage? Let's say we have a strong range advantage, okay? In this scenario, we're betting 80% or more. Now, when I say betting 80%, I don't mean we're betting every single hand in our range 80% of the time. I mean, some hands are betting more frequently than others, right? Um, however, some of these boards are so good to the point that um, you can be betting very, very frequently. So let's say we have a strong range advantage. We would move over here to do we have the range advantage? We'd go to yes. Do we have the nut advantage? Maybe we do, maybe we don't. Let's say we don't. If we don't, we want to bet small. Okay? If we do, we want to ask, does our opponent have good range connectivity? If they do, like on ace-king-jack, we want to be betting big. If they don't, like on queen-queen-five, we want to be betting small. Okay? What if we have a moderate advantage? Eh, that's somewhere in the middle. If we have a weak advantage, though, we do not. When we are not betting, we're going to be betting using a large size. Okay? For a matter of position, same thing. Typically, you just have to do more checking as your range advantage is weaker across the board. And that's going to lead to you betting a little bit more polarized in general, but we're going to be discussing that coming up. Then we're going to go through a bunch of examples. If you know the poker coaching homework, ooh, you'll be familiar with these because we're going to go through lots and lots of examples. Let's take a look at this one. Figure this out together. Um, under the gun, plus one versus big blind on ace, jack, five. You raise under the gun, plus one. Big blind calls, all comes ace, jack, five. Big blind checks. Use the range, uh, range analyzer that we have at poker coaching. 
and just classify all the hands. Don't even think about trying to be balanced or anything. Just straight up classify the hands. Notice, what is a premium hand here? Probably like good aces and better. Okay, so those are red. Those are premium hands. The marginal hands are going to be stuff like pairs and um, really just all the pairs, right? Which is what we have, sixes and better, all the aces, all the jacks, etc. cetera. Um, draws are gonna be, well, it's kind of hard to find draws here. It's not just the spade draws. We have gut shots, right? King, queen, king, 10, queen, 10, king, nine of spades and hearts for backdoor flush draw, right? All those. And then we have some junk, which are these draws that have no backdoor equity. So just categorizing this. If you think back to the ratios I said we could have, remember we could have up to two draws to every one premium hand, but instead we have way more premium hands than draws, right? All right, fine. Remember how we could have 70% marginal and 30% junk, but here we have 40 to six, which is like uh, 85 to 15. So we have way too little junk and draws. We have too few draws and too few junk. Whenever that happens, whenever you just kind of generally categorize your hands in the range analyzer and you do this somewhat logically, that means you have a big range advantage because we don't have the weaker portions of our range. They just don't exist. Whenever we don't have the weaker portions of our range, that indicates we have a giant range advantage. And you know, when we have a giant range advantage, we bet very frequently, right? So this is a spot where we're not going to bet with just our premium hands and draws. We're going to be betting with actually everything. And as we see, Pio Solver confirms this. We are, uh, we're supposed to be betting in this scenario about 95% uh, of the time, which for all practical purposes is everything. And as you see in this scenario, due to range connectivity, it actually skews towards a bigger bet size, right? Because on ace-jack-5, if your opponent has an ace or a jack, they're just not going to fold, and our aces are generally going to be in better shape against their aces. Then we go through the spot button versus big blind, right? Same story. Then we go through the spot under the gun plus one against button where you're out of position, but now you have to check some. Now you have to check some because you're out of position. And this is where this implementable strategy starts to deviate a bit from the solver strategy. And we discuss ways to, you know, make sure you're not playing too far off of it. But you see here, solver actually checks 70-ish percent of the time, right? And it's checking using a very uh, mixed strategy as it basically always will. And this is where you have to realize, okay, we're not trying to play like the solver where we're just checking, you know, some hands most of the time. We are going to try to be implementable. In exchange for this, we're gonna give up a little bit of equity but we're gonna be able to implement the strategy at the table, which is very, very valuable. Being able to show up and make better decisions than your opponents the vast majority of the time is gonna result in you winning money long-term. So anyway, then we go through all sorts of flops, king, king, six, queen, 10, five, jack, six, two. Let's find some that are bad. Ooh, jack, six, six, here's a neat one. Okay, you raise under gun plus one, big blind calls, jack, six, six. Same story, categorize your hands. This is a cool spot where, again, we completely lack junk and draws, which indicates a range advantage, okay? However, we completely lack the nut advantage. If we take a look at what the solver does here, solver actually checks back a ton, okay? Which other... Daniel, I have no clue what you're trying to ask me here. This is a completely new course. I made all of it <laughs> over the last... Year, it took me forever, but we finally got it done. As you see here, Solver actually checks a ton, right? And the reason it's checking a ton is because we completely lack the nut advantage. And going through, take a look at this, right? I'm recommending using this, we'll call it uh, the, the, the JL system. Using the JL system, we're checking 56% of the time. Solver checks 60% of the time, so like pretty close, right? Remember I said on Jack 6-6, six, six, uh, there is no range connectivity in this scenario, we're supposed to be betting small, right? Look, solver bets small. And as you see, this all lines up right on top of itself, right? I mean, like essentially, the strategy that I'm recommending, the implementable strategy, lines up very nicely with the solver strategy. For a semi-professional to the highest possible, which courses would I recommend? This one. For example, Master GTO Short Stack Play. That is a different course, Daniel. This is called the Tournament Masterclass. We released it yesterday. We have lots of courses at PokerCoaching.com. This is by far the most thorough, most advanced. And um, this is this is essentially going to become a prerequisite for everyone if you want to talk to me about how to play poker tournaments. <laughs> All right, now when you do not have the range advantage, right? Again, use the 
um, hand types flowchart, as you can see here. Premiums, 33%, draw 67% at most. It's okay if you have fewer. Marginal, 70, junk 30. Again, fewer junk is fine. Okay, again, you're just gonna go through and use this chart. Using this flow chart is gonna go a long way to helping you figure out these scenarios. So, let's take a look at this. We raise under gun plus one, big blind calls, nine, seven, five. We know this is not a great board for us. Whenever we're gonna do a lot of checking, you wanna make sure you're protecting your checking range by checking back with some very strong hands like pocket aces and pocket kings, maybe pocket nines, maybe pocket sevens. And um, go through, categorize the hands. As we see here, 18% premium, 34% draws. We're pretty close to that two to one ratio, right? Marginal, 39, junk, eight. It's pretty close to that 70-30 ratio. Using this strategy, you'll probably be fine. Let's just see what this looks like. We're checking uh, 40 something percent, 46% of the time, 47%. Solver checks 45%, which is beautiful. You wanna make sure that ideally your frequencies line up somewhere near the solver and that the majority of hands that you are betting line up with the majority of the hands the solver are betting and the majority of the hands that you're checking line up with the majority of hands the solver is checking. And um, that's pretty much what we're doing in this scenario, which is which is good, right? Take a look at this, button versus big blind. This starts to get pretty gross because we're actually pushing the boundaries uh, very much here because now we have 30% draws to 16% junk, or to 16% premium. So right at the two to one ratio, marginal to junk, 37 to 16, 70, 30, it's barely there. Um, essentially in this scenario, it's pretty, pretty rough. What do I have us checking? I was checking 55%. Solver checks 53%. Beautiful, right? Beautiful. Why would we check aces and kings but not pocket queens? Take a second. I bet you can figure it out. This is a logic puzzle for everyone out there. Why would you rather check aces and kings but not queens? Look at what the solver does, right? Why would you rather check queens than jacks and tens on 975? Well, because aces and kings are less likely to be outdrawn. Right? If you have aces and you check it back and a queen comes, you still probably have the best hand. If you check it back with queens and an ace comes, you could easily be beat. Right, So you're not just betting because your hand is better. That's not how this works, which is kind of interesting. Protection is very relevant. Value is very relevant. Realize aces and queens can get the same amount of value. But whenever we're checking in these scenarios, it's because we are not concerned with being outdrawn nearly as much. We go through 743, right? Notice here, I had us checking 33%. Uh, Solver had us checking 31%, which is you know very, very close again. And to be clear, I made all of these images before I even looked at the solver, which is quite relevant because it essentially shows that this system we are using lines up very nicely with the solver. And understanding how your, your range should be played and recognizing it actually does line up with solver is good, right? It means that these strategies we are teaching are implementable, but also relatively close to the solver, which is great. All right, let's see, let's see. We go through common mistakes, right? People have too much junk in their range. Essentially, that results in them folding too often, too many marginal hands. We go through a bunch of common mistakes, overvaluing hands, slow playing too often, over bluffing with junk. Okay, all sorts of stuff here. As the preflop caller. All right, now, now it gets kind of murky. Again, we're gonna play similar to the preflop raiser without the advantage, right? Because um, now we're not gonna have the advantage, right? We already saw that the preflop caller very rarely does not have much of an advantage where it's like 50-50. So take a look. Under the gun plus raises, you call on the button, ace, jack, five. Under the gun plus one checks. We're playing 40 big blinds deep. So here we're check raising just our best hands. These are gonna be our good top pairs and better. We're check raising some draws, mainly some draws that are too weak to get it all in, like queen, 10 of diamonds. Check raising flush draws, which are gonna to have to probably get it all in. Check calling a lot of marginal made hands. These are gonna be some aces, some jacks, some under pairs. Eh, you know, maybe two should be folded here immediately. It's kind of dicey. And then doing it with some junk, checking some junk. And um, turns out Solver does similarly. Actually, Solver picks slightly different bluffs, which is kind of neat to see. This is something we have found when, we, when we've gone through this. Solver often picks like 
pocket fours to check raise, which a lot of people will not find intuitive. Essentially, when you don't really want to check raise your draws, like, um, let's say, let's say, what do we want to say here? Like Jack 10 of spades, right? This is a hand that you don't necessarily want to check raise for value because it's probably behind if you get called. As a draw, well, yeah, you can check raise it, but you don't really love getting it in. That's a hand that may prefer to call, right? Same thing like, um, take a look at a nine eight of spades, right? Nine eight of spades is a flush draw, but you can see it's check, it's check raising it way less than 25% of the time. It means it's calling it sometimes, right? You don't really want to check raise nine eight of spades and get jammed on. So solver opts to find addition, uh, different bluffs like five four. You can check raise the five four, and if you get jammed on, you can fold. Check raise the uh, five three. You, get fold, you can fold, right? So kind of cool to see Solver picking some really, really low equity bluffs. Notice Solver is check raising the top pairs, right? And we go through all sorts of scenarios like this. Jack 6-6. Six, six. Uh, this will be a fun one. So let's see, let's see, let's see. Ah, so this is when we're in position first. I was wondering why it's calling so much. All right, facing a bet out of position. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So in this scenario, um, big blind versus under the gun plus one against 67% pot bet, kind of a big bet. You can see here you're doing a lot of folding on this flop, right? Lots and lots of folding because you're in bad shape. Against the bigger bet size on this flop, you're also in bad shape, right? This is a spot where you have to do a lot of overfolding. We discuss minimum defense frequency, how you don't need to defend at minimum defense frequency. We give the implementable strategy for this as well. It's continued betting every time an acceptable strategy, although not the best strategy. Well, it's of course not the best, best strategy. I'm, I'm already showing you the best strategy. Best strategy is to play the GTO solution. Very, very comparable strategy is to play what I'm recommending here that you can learn to implement. Um, is it a, an acceptable strategy? Depends on how much money you want to lose, right? Think about it. An, ex uh, an acceptable strategy is to just fold every time, right? If you just fold every time, sure, I guess you're going to lose. I mean, the question is like, how much do you want to lose? Do you want to lose a little bit or a lot? And also, do you actually want to put in effort to get good or not? This course is for people who want to put in effort. This course is not for people who want to study 10 minutes and go gamble. If that's you, this is not for you. And that's okay. Everything's not for everyone. This is for people who want to study and actually get very, very good at poker. Um, but I mean, is it, I guess, is betting every time better than checking every time? Like, uh, I guess, I guess. Why do you not want to raise and get it all in with a pair and a flush draw? Because when you get it all in, you're often against better pairs and, and premium draws. And against that range, you're not in great shape. You're in fine shape, but not great shape. Also, it doesn't protect your calling range. It's important to make sure you have some draws in your calling range. I just showed you the solver has some draws in its raising range and calling range, right? A very, very easy way to do that is to call with the hands that can easily continue calling down, like pairs, right? So pairs with flush draws make very, very good calls. So anyway, as you see here, um, I'm I'm check raising 8%, solver check raising 13%. I have noticed solver check raises a little bit more than I do from out of position, and that's that's fine. Uh, it's not like a lot more, but as often as a little bit more. I was folding 50%, solver's folding 50%, which is good, right? So anyway, you wanna go through and see how the solver plays and compare it to how you're playing and uh, make sure it lines up. Here I'm check raising 13, folding 57. Here solver check raises 12, folds 62, so close. Solver also like does a whole lot of folding kind of early in hands, like ace-10, for example, on this board. Solver just opts to check fold ace-10 and ace-jack on king-king-6 out of position against the third pot bet. I'm not sure that's good against the player pool because most of the player pool doesn't continue barreling, right? If you know they're going to continue barreling, then it gets way, way dicier. But if they're not going to continue barreling, you'll, re you'll realize your equity better. So it's important to realize that Solver assumes you are playing against a good world-class opponent, which you're not. All right, let's take a look at this spot. 40 big blinds, big blind versus under the gun plus one. Um, let's see, we're facing a third pot bet on jack six six. Notice here, I have a lot of check raising, some check calling, lots of folds. Notice solver check raises a ton too, 25% of the time, goodness gracious. I guess that's what I was doing too, 27%. I've learned on these low card boards, 
to check raise a lot. Check raise most of your sixes. Check raise most of your jacks, or your good jacks at least, right? And then you check raise all sorts of nonsense that can't win at the showdown. All sorts of nonsense, like um, king eight, back door draw, king five, back door draw, seven five, back door draw, right? Five four, back door draw, nine eight, back door draw. Check raise a ton in this scenario. You can often check raise very, very small. It's a really, really strong strategy that'll put your opponents in terrible scenarios. And we go through all sorts of scenarios. We have these boards, let's see. As the preflop raiser out of position facing a bet. This is after you check, right? This is where it gets it gets tricky, right? So let's say we raise under the gun plus one against button, we check. Flop comes ace check five. Now what do we do? As we see, one thing solver does here is the check raise is a little bit more than I recommend, but that's because the solver is using these very, very mixed strategies, right? So it always has some ace king and ace queen and ace jack, whereas we do not. That often leads to our ranges being different at this point, which is where we do start to lose a little bit of EV in exchange for being very implementable. But what we've done to compensate for this is we make our check calling range a whole lot stronger. So right here, we see solver has like half of each of these ace x combinations, whereas I have all of them, right? And that goes a long way to strengthening your range. Um, we go through many, many spots like this. Let's take a look at this one. Under the gun plus against button versus 33% pop bet on 743. Notice we do a lot of checking on this board. This is a board that we should be checking a ton. And when we do check, we're often check raising with our over pairs, right? 40 big blinds deep. And as you see, we have those built in. Check raising 19%, solver check raises 22%, which is good. Good and nice. Folding 34%, I'm folding not even that much. I'm folding less than that. I don't like folding. Check from out of position. Yes, that's what we said. You're supposed to check from out of position sometimes. We've already covered that today. We discuss as the preflop raiser in position facing a bet. This means we were led into. We go through how to play against leads, go through a bunch of hand examples. All right, that's all preflop stuff. We discuss three bet pots, right, and the differences. We discuss, you know, how to go through and play preflop ranges. As you see, our ranges are going to be 100% frequency, whereas Solver is going to be using various mixed frequencies. So ranges are going to not be quite the same. But strategies often line up. And very often, like, the same logic still applies, right? Like, I don't even have to tell you what we're looking at here, but if you look, we lack draws and we lack junk, right? We know we get to have, well, in three-bet pots, like 1.5 draws to every one premium hand. Notice we don't have anywhere near that. We have way fewer draws than necessary. 70-30 marginal to junk. Again, way too little junk. So we know this is a spot where we have a big range advantage. Big range advantage leads to betting very frequently, 100% of the time, right? So we go through all of this. Three-bet pots is the preflop caller. Again, giving you various flow charts to use. Not going to go through all these. Loads and loads of solver images. So this is a big course, by the way. Going back to uh, preflop, 300-something slides long preflop. We're, th we're currently 306 slides into postflop, and uh, we're not even finished with the flop yet. We discuss four bet pots, some spots you want to bet very frequently, some spots you're going to be doing a lot more checking. Who are the contributors to making this course? Me. <laughs> just me. Actually, I have a team of people who help me get the PowerPoint together. Mainly just GTO and Johnny of Clutch Prep, who is that he owns a uh, college tutoring course because he teaches people better than college professors teach them. And I figured I would enlist his help to help me get everything together. He helped with a lot of these um, images to help um, get all this kind of stuff together because I'm not the best at that. Just GTO ran loads of solutions for us, like as we see here, right? Four bet pots, 60 big blinds deep, etc. But I made all the, I recorded all of the content. <clears throat> and I had, you know, outlined all the content. Definitely a team effort, though. Short stacked adjustments. We go through the differences as stacks get shallower. We discuss how ranges get different as stacks get shallower. Looks like the complete package for tournaments. Oh, it is. <laughs> we wanted this to be... So, look, I, I knew a while back I wanted to make... A very basic but thorough basics course. Master the fundamentals. We already did that. It's completely free. Pokercoaching.com slash fundamentals, I think. Also, we have the cash game course. And we have the tournament course. Cash game course was great. You all loved it. I released it about a year ago. And I knew we could probably get way more advanced if we felt inclined. So, with the tournament course, I decided, all right, we're going to go all out. 
We're going to do our best to make this thing as thorough as we possibly can. And um, that's what we did. I thought it would take like a month. It took a year. <laughs> it took a year off my life. Now my beard is gray instead of brown. Oh, goodness. Um, so anyway, this is meant to be all we need for tournaments. And I mean, I don't really, I, I guess in theory we could go through and slot in changes as, as necessary in the future, but I, I'm not really even sure that's going to need to happen anytime in the near future. We discuss um, how strategies change as we get shallower. Like right here, right? Ace Jack 5. What is the main difference? It turns out frequencies don't actually change all that much, but um, sizing does. So we see we're betting bigger in general when we're 40 big blinds deep compared to 20 big blinds deep, right? And, and that's important to note, right? Also, we're doing a whole lot more raising out of position as we get shallower, right? As we see here, we're raised, same scenario, but we're raising 20% of the time out of, or uh, 40 big blinds deep, 31% um, when we're shallower. Do you need Pio Solver? No, you don't. I already ran all these solutions for you. I mean, all of this stuff is available. So we go through lots and lots of this. Let's see, let's see, let's see. You know, lots, lots and lots and lots and lots of this. Lots and lots of scenarios to so make sure you understand the differences as a preflop caller when checked to. And I go through and explain all of this. It, you know, it takes many, many hours, 30, 30 plus hour long course. How do you get this? You sign up for Poker Coaching Premium. It's only available in Poker Coaching Premium. You can actually get a big discount on Poker Coaching Premium right now at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. Three bet pots is the preflop aggressor. Oh, playing the turn, finally playing the turn. All that was just to get through the flop. Um, main difference, you have to have fewer draw, fewer draws, right? Then on the river, you have even fewer draws slash bluffs. I'm not even going to go through the turn. Um, well, I'm going to go through it very briefly because we're running out of time. We have positive equity turns, neutral equity turns, negative equity turns. That's going to impact your betting decision. We go through and show how various turns impact your equity on various boards, right? Under the gun plus one against big blind. Under the gun plus one bets very frequently here, but big blind has a whole lot of jacks and fives. Notice some of the jacks are actually some of the worst cards in the deck for you, right? Do you have range charts for specific positions in big blinds? Yes, yes. We have all sorts of charts for you. We show how that changes your betting frequency, like on a jack, for example. On jack turns, you bet basically never, right? Because that's a very low equity turn for you. Turns out, turns that are good for you, like a king and a queen and a 10, you're going to bet a whole lot, right? Look, king and queen and 10, you bet a whole lot. Low equity turns like jacks and fives and low spades, you bet pretty infrequently, right? There you go. We show how we go through and play various spots. We go through all sorts of scenarios like this. On jack six two, we discuss high equity and low equity. Nine seven five, high equity and low equity, right? We go through lots and lots of this from all positions, in position, in position, out of position, three bet pots, single raise pots, etc. Turn probing, whenever it goes check, check on the flop, you bet the turn. When should you be betting the turn, right? For example, on an ace turn, and a king turn, and a queen turn, and a jack turn, well, ace and ace mainly, on an ace turn, you're basically never going to bet. Did you know this? Someone raises, you call from the big blind, flop comes 9-7-5, it goes check, check, turns an ace, you should never bet. Notice here, on an ace turn and king turn, you check literally 98% of the time or more. Why? Because those turns are really bad for you, right? However, on the low turns, you should be betting almost every time right? On a six five four three two, you should be betting 70 something percent of the time or more. What's the price for this chart? You cannot, or for this course, you cannot buy this course. It's only available in Poker Coaching Premium. Think like Netflix, right? You want to buy, what's the Netflix show? I don't even know what Netflix shows are. Uh, you want to buy the Umbrella Academy. I'm trying to think, what did I see recently? I didn't see, I didn't see the show. You can't buy it. You can watch it on net on Netflix. Well, if you want this, you can watch it on Poker Coaching Premium. Anyway, we go through lots of scenarios like this, explain how to play these with implementable charts. Ooh, look at this ugly one. Queen, 10, 7. Queen's Gambit. There you go. You're so out of touch. This It came out a week ago. You're so out of touch. Yeah, the, you want to watch the Queen's Gambit, you got to subscribe to Netflix. You want to watch this and lots of the other stuff we have available, you got to subscribe to Poker Coaching Premium. Just cover bounty tournaments briefly. Um, on this scenario, you should lead basically never, almost never when you are leading just your best hands and your draw and your draws. Anyway, lots of scenarios like this, jack six, six, when it goes check, check, you don't actually get to do a lot of betting, but when you are betting, you're betting big because you're polarized. 
So we go through all this, lots and lots of stuff here. We're on slide 524, by the way, if you're, if you're keeping track. We discuss leading the turn. Ooh, leading the turn's fun. We discuss when to lead turn, plus EV cards. We discuss when to lead. Negative EV turns, you just don't lead, right? Like an ace. Jack 6-2, don't lead an ace. However, on these lower card boards, you may at least consider it, like a six especially, right? Ooh, look at that beautiful six. You're supposed to be leading that six almost every time, right? And we keep going through this, lots and lots of this. When we can get to the river. Oh, here we are. If you're keeping track, slide 579 of the post-flop section. The river is complicated. I really want to show you a few charts here. Um, let's see. How do we break down our range, right? We want to essentially break our range down into all sorts of scenarios, right? To where, like, some of the... Uh, it's, it's a spectrum. We have a spectrum of hands. And then, on that spectrum of hands... This is how we're going to structure our range. We're going to have two bluffing ranges, right? We're going to have a small bet size, or two betting ranges. We're going to have a small bet size and a big bet size. Small bet size contains a little bit of bluffs, lots of thin value, and a little bit of nuts. Large bet size contains some lot more bluffs and value hands, lots of high value hands, right? Does this chart just have theory or me playing? Oh, no, I play for about 20 hours or more in this, and I go through a bunch of tournament wins that I had over the last few months. We discussed structuring your bet sizes. As you're betting smaller, you need to make sure you have some premium. All bet sizes should have premium. Little bit of bluffs for a 10% 10, 10 pot bet size. Lots of bluffs for a 300% pot bet size. Let me go through the river. We have the um, bluffing decision flow chart. Why am I choosing this hand to bluff? Is my opponent capable of folding? No. Well, then don't bluff. Are they capable of folding? Yes. All right. That's good. Do I lack showdown value? If you lack showdown value, meaning you can't win if it goes check, check, you should be more inclined to bluff. Do you have many value hands in your range? If you don't have very many, you probably shouldn't be bluffing very often, right? If you do, then you should be bluffing very frequently. Are my blockers highly relevant? If they are, be more inclined to bluff. Do I unblock my opponent's folds? Does my bluff tell a credible story? Does it make logical sense? Okay, say we decide to bluff. Now, which size do we use? Do I have completely no showdown value? If the answer is yes, often you want to bet large. If you have some showdown value, Maybe it fits in the small range. Does my opponent have many marginal made hands? If yes, you want to bet big. If no, then it kind of implies they have a lot of really good hands or really bad hands. Um, then you want to be betting small. Anyway, lots of questions. You can go through this. We go through the flow chart, go through examples to figure out should you be bluffing, what size should you use, etc. We discuss positional differences, betting from out of position. Again, more pile work. We show the actual complete betting range that the solver uses. Like as we see here, the small bet range is almost all third pair, thin value hands, a little bit of bluffs, and a little bit of nuts, right? And we show that the um, other range always contains some nut hands too. We discussed that. Again, we're running out of time here. All in range, as you can see, all nuts or nothing, which is very worth noting. All in range, all nuts or nothing, 50% pot range, a little bit of nuts, lots of marginal top pair hands, a little bit of nothing, right? And we go through lots and lots of this. We discuss when facing a bet, when deciding to call. Calling with a bluff catcher flow chart. Are you beating any bluff, any value hands? If that, if so, that means you're not really a bluff catcher, so you have an easy call. Does your opponent have an obvious, have enough obvious bluffs? If yes, be more inclined to call. Is the opponent capable of finding the right number of bluffs? If they're not, then you should be like inclined to fold, right? Is my opponent capable of turning weak showdown value hands into bluffs? If they are, be more inclined to call. Does my hand unblock any the most obvious bluffs? Like, you don't want to have the ace of spades if the ace of spades is the most relevant bluff card, right? Let me go through examples of this. Examples, examples, examples. Lots of examples. When you bet and get raised on the river. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Fun spots. Multi-way on the river. Doesn't happen very often. Let me go through a few multi-way examples. Okay, that's just, the, that's just the basics. Now, ICM, when there are payout implications. We discuss a few ICM examples. We discuss the idea of risk premium. And we have the risk premium matrix. Very, very important. Very, very important. Essentially, when you're the big stack against your opponent's big stack, if all of your stack is at risk, you're going to have a very big risk premium. Essentially, 
you have to have between 18 and 35 percent equity more to justify calling off for all of your money depending on the exact scenario in the presence of various short stacks if you're a big stack against a medium stack risk premium still exists right short stack against the short stack a little bit of risk premium not a ton but this risk premium matrix is very important we go through a few examples discussing the exact scenarios that you can be in we go through um specific hands specific uh spots right explaining um you know risk specific amounts of risk premium not everyone is aware of icm we discuss icm adjustments lots and lots of hand examples and we discuss various stack depth examples okay okay and then other topics shorthanded tournaments heads up tournaments turbo tournaments re-entry tournaments satellites lots on satellites here right lots of content on satellites early level adjustments late level adjustments bounty tournaments so there you go somebody asked about bounty tournaments and then a little bit little bit on regular bounty tournaments then we have pko tournaments we go through pko tournaments there's a pko bounty uh spreadsheet by the way that you can have access to as a poker coaching member we discuss finances with bankroll management bankroll management with 30 percent roi which is what a lot of people have in most games they're going to be playing or a little bit less or a little bit more as you can see if you're playing gigantic field tournaments with a small roi you're going to need 375 buy-ins good luck with that game selection we discuss game selection in tournaments which is actually very very relevant skill assessment we discuss the rake the rake matters we discuss deal making right we discuss getting um fair equity chip chops icm chops saves saves examples how to how to trick your opponents <laughs> if they don't know if they don't know math we discuss the uh difference in making a save like making a save in this hypothetical scenario makes a short stack thirty three thousand dollars there you go do i think pkos are the future of tournament poker um no very very difficult to implement in the live arena we discuss backing markup makeup what's your roi roi considerations do you care if the backer is profitable we discuss bad deal for backers right because you want to make sure you're not screwing your backer do you need backing poker is a great get rich slow game other topics tells we go through tells mindset stuff we go through mindset continued learning i think that's it oh that's not it then we have a lot of uh let me look up this thing We'll tell you all the, all of the play and explain that's included here. Whenever you go to the site, go to uh, courses, click on tournament master class right there at the top. Uh, hand history reviews. Okay, let's see what we got. Fifty dollar online tournament review with me. Fifty five dollar tournament win with me. Hundred fifty dollar tournament went second place with me. Six hundred thirty dollar tournament win with me thousand dollar high stakes third with me high stakes pko second place with me <laughs> that was a long one um 88 satellite win in a 2600 tournament 100 satellite win in a 2600 tournament 160 satellite win in a 2600 tournament those are actually all from one day <laughs> i remember that. that was a good day um and then just a full sunday session like i was streaming but i was streaming it just for me so anyway that's that that's the tournament course how do you get it it's part of the black friday sale check out pokercoaching.com slash black friday should be a link below this video <sighs> took a long time to make this stuff i hope you enjoy it as you can see tournament masterclass just launched for premium members it is not for sale you can only get it as part of poker coaching premium we should change this it's this more than 30 hours if you count all the plain explains and stuff let's see as we go through here list of poker coaching premium and the benefits we have weekly live webinars giraffe ganger streaming today number one player in the world online last year he is streaming for all of you today starting at 3 p.m eastern time we have the gto preflop charts we didn't mean to talk about that here's prices if you want to sign up for three years first time we've ever offered three years we didn't know if we were going to actually do poker coaching premium long term but we are um, you can get it for 39 bucks a month it's the same price as poker coaching the standard membership but if you sign up for three years at a time you can get premium for the exact same price 39 bucks a month also included 
many, many other courses. Mastering the short stack play, my complete guide to single table satellites, WSOP prep sessions with Blas Zerja, one of our students who turned, what did he turn? Was it $5 into $1.3 million? Something like that. They did it again this year. He won 480 k recently on Party Poker. Lots and lots of stuff here. That's all. That's just the tournament stuff. Then we have cash game stuff. We have the cash game masterclass. Crushing tough cash games, beating wild games. I remember that was a fun video series. All of these, by the way, are like four to six hours long or, or more. Tournament masterclasses or cash game masterclasses is very long. But all of these are substantial. Why aren't I home? I am at home, just not in my office. I went to Vegas and I quarantined for a while. Seemed like the responsible thing to do. So that's that. So if we pay $39, we get the masterclass for a month. No, Bod Mahdi. If you sign up for three years of poker coaching premium ahead of time at the price of $39 a month, then you get access to it the entire time for that three-year period. Like Netflix. Think about Netflix. All right. Kind of like Netflix, except for we offer three-year subscriptions at a time at a much discounted price. Whereas they don't. Um, let's see. Mindset stuff. We have stuff by Jared Tendler, Dr. Trisha Cardner, Elliot Rowe. All sorts of stuff available. Check it out. Pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. I have to get going. Sail in soon. Might as well get in it. We try to have an exclusive, extensive library so you can find the answers to whatever you need. Did we mention we have over a thousand quizzes? Lots of homework challenges. What else? Lots and lots of live streams. Um, classes. Oh, if you're a Poker Coaching Premium, premium member, I have loads and loads of classes, 30 minute long videos on specific topics where I answer the students' questions. Students ask me questions that are kind of in depth, take a little bit of time to answer, usually a little bit technical, and I answer them. All of that's there. Anyway, I have to get going. Check this out, pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. Hope you enjoy it. We also have a giveaway. We're giving away a thousand bucks for fun. Check that out at pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday giveaway. Kind of like Netflix, except for whenever you subscribe to Netflix, you lose money. Whenever you subscribe to Poker Coaching, you win money. <laughs> That's exactly it. <laughs> oh, goodness. How's my poker career? career? Great. <clears throat> am I still playing? Yes, of course I am. You play on GG. Sometimes. Main event. I don't know. I would have to get up to go to New Jersey to go play the main event. I'm probably not even going to do that. It's such a pain to go to New Jersey. Oh, my God. All right, that's going to be it for today. Have a great day. Check it out, pokercoaching.com slash Black Friday. If you like this, click like, click subscribe. I would appreciate it. Hope you enjoyed the little walkthrough through the tournament course. I know we breezed through it. We didn't cover a whole lot, but that's why the tournament course is uh, very, very long. <laughs> and it's very, very in-depth. Look, if you want to get good at tournament poker, that's what you want to do. I've already shared it with a bunch of my students. They've already improved a ton. They love it. And um, that's what we're going for. Have a great day. Enjoy yourselves. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.